Oh, hello, everyone, and welcome back to our uh, monthly series. We're very pleased this afternoon to present uh, Dr. James Newell, who is an educator, professional musician, and he's the director of the Depth Psychology Alliance, which is a national organization. Uh, James earned his master's degree in pastoral counseling and theology from Vanderbilt uh, Divinity School with a focus on Jungian psychology. And then he earned his doctorate in history of religions from the Vanderbilt University Graduate School of Religion. So he spent a number of years here in Nashville and uh, he's taught courses in world religions for Western Kentucky University, Central Michigan University, Excelsior College and other schools. For the past several years, he's been developing a certification program in depth psychology offered through the Depth Psychology Alliance. And I will say, he didn't ask me to give this a plug, but he teaches online classes in depth psychology and union psychology. Um, any of you can access these by going to Depth Psychology Alliance. Today's talk on union creativity will give you a taste of the class he's going to be offering an eight part class coming up uh, starting in October. So we are welcoming him and I'll turn it over to Dr. Newell. Well, thank you, Adele. And uh, especially want to thank Adele for being very persistent and getting me things kept coming up so I couldn't uh, do this, but I'm happy to do it now. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, also, um, I am offering classes through the Deaf Psychology Alliance, but there also are um, video on demand courses on uh, Depth Psychology Academy, which is www.depthpsychologyacademy.com. So I'm going to go ahead and I mean, let me know. Can you see that? Everybody can see it? Okay. So, um, thank you all. I uh, appreciate it. I, I use a PowerPoint, and you'll see as I go through, there's a lot of words. I won't necessarily be reading it, but it keeps me from digressing. Uh, that's one reason. The other reason I have it is that uh, a lot of times afterwards, if... Uh, you can either usually people email me or you can email Adele and uh, get a copy of the PowerPoint. So if you uh, want to follow, you don't have to take notes and you can follow up that way if you like. So uh, I was asked to uh, talk on Jung and creativity because uh, I'm going to be offering this course. Uh, and uh, Adele saw that and everyone was interested in that. And I uh, usually do a free introductory class. And this is going to be very much like the introductory class that I'm going to be doing uh, on October 15th to introduce people to the course. So um, the big question that naturally comes up, uh, why Jung? Why should we be particularly interested in Jung in relation to creativity? And uh, from my point of view, in order to, uh, to really understand uh, the importance of Jung in relation to creativity, uh, we want to understand the importance of the creative process in uh, concert with how Jung understands the processes of the psyche. And when you go to this, there's a whole industry really of people teaching about creativity and creativity in business and creativity in teaching, you know, in educational programs and uh, all kinds of different ways. And whenever we, if you, if you look at some of the literature related to those things, they tend to focus on the mysterious aspects of creativity, the need for us to hold back our thinking mind, the uh, uh, Marie-Louise von Franz likes to call it the, the monkey mind, but uh, to basically be able to listen to the voice of uh, our inner world and listen to nonlinear subjective experience. For a Jungian, uh, this means for us pretty much uh, simply to listen to the unconscious as we engage in the creative process, and that's not a surprise for Jungians. The thing that's important about Jung in that regard is that for Jung he's got a whole clear map, some call it the anatomy of the psyche, but a map of how creative energy moves uh, through the psyche. And this is, he calls it the individuation process, uh, von Franz calls it the uh, process of psychological maturation. But uh, when we get to, there are really two stages of the individuation process. Usually Jung focused almost uh, exclusively. You always hear about how he focused on the um, second half of life. 
And you could also say that's the second half of the individuation process. And in that part, he would encourage people to uh, listen to the unconscious, to dialogue with the unconscious, and to try to integrate contents of the unconscious into consciousness. And when we look at his process, which I'm going to do in some more detail, trying to show how it uh, intersects with the creative process, when you look at that, you see those parallels. And uh, as I said, I'm going to try and bring that out a little more clearly as we go through. Now, another reason that Jung can be extremely helpful is that uh, when trying to understand the creative process is because unlike other uh, psychological theorists, uh, the the mystery of the unconscious doesn't go away. It's always going to be something mysterious. But for Jung, it's not only mysterious. There's a structure to the unconscious. There's not only traceable uh, ways to map where energy is going, but there are particular structures that tend to mediate and steward energies to consciousness, or sometimes uh, those energies are blocked, and that's a lot of the work that we do uh, with psychotherapy and Jungian work is to try to remove those blocks. So having an awareness, of course, of this structure, or these structures, and the way the movement of energy goes through the psyche can certainly be very uh, helpful a to avoid being overwhelmed by the unconscious and and b to be able to use our awareness of those structures to uh, mediate the creative process when we're stuck or when we're trying to uh, just turn it into a uh, uh, an ongoing disciplined process so um I'm going to try and break this down into a couple different areas, as you'll see. But when we look at the word creativity itself, like so many uh, other things, uh, other terms and ideas, many people have different ideas and different definitions of the term creativity. For some people, they're very dogmatic and see it as being, if something isn't completely original, uh, then it's not really creative. And of course, that's not, uh, in most disciplines, that's, that's kind of... Uh, crazy. Everybody uses the same words. People like to say that Beethoven used the same notes that uh, Charlie Parker used and uh, that kind of thing. So we're, we're always building on things and uh, moving things. But uh, for us, for today, well, I want to think of creativity specifically referring to the use of imaginations to uh, be productive in the world. I'll say that. So uh, creativity can refer to all these ideas and many others. Uh, life itself is creative. Our physical bodies are continually recreating themselves. New cells are being born every moment. Old cells are dying. When we look at it uh, in, the, in the religious realm and in the sense of mythology, uh, the world is called the creation. The deity is the creator. Uh, an interesting field of study when you want to understand creativity is, is uh, the creation myths. Uh, Marie-Louise von Franz has a lovely book focusing just on creation myths and how they uh, can represent the, the beginnings often of, of how creativity blossoms in the psyche. And also if you look at the beginning sections of Eric Neumann's book, Origins and History of Consciousness, uh, he also kind of starts at that place where the creation is um, basically what you could say symbolically is the the differentiation of the ego from the uh, the unconscious and from the archetype of the self. So the question remains, though, uh, how exactly, how in, in a step-by-step -step way can Jung help us to understand creativity? And as I say, the first step in answering that is going to be to understand the individuation process itself. And I know many of you, of course, are very uh, familiar with Jung, so uh, some of this will be familiar to you. I hope I can present it in a way that's uh, a little innovative and, and particularly in the way it connects to creativity. And uh, knowing about the individuation process and knowing about the particular structures of the psyche and the structures of the individuation process and how uh, those structures are activated by creative energy and again how they can be blocked uh, if we're not doing the kind of work that, that Jung recommends and the creative act can actually be a part of that work and for Jung it often was a part of that work. So before I get into a specific description of the structure of the psyche and how it relates to uh, to creativity I want to kind of lay out uh, just a 
a couple of categories. We need to break things into categories in order to, to, to know where we are. They're not, never when we do this thing and break things into categories, are they discrete categories? There's always some porousness, but it helps us just to organize a little bit. So what I want to talk about in terms of creativity is the idea of creativity itself, the idea of healing in relation to creativity, the idea of craft as it relates to the creative process, and then uh, art and high art, which uh, is going to involve more of the uh, the deep layers of the unconscious. So, just to start out with, you know, starting with this list, um, I would like to relate the idea of creativity, or what many call the creative spirit, to what Jung calls psychic energy, and that's not psychic like the psychic hotline. That means psychological energy, the energy uh, Freud called it the libido. But he related that specifically to sexual energy. And for Jung, it was not simply sexual energy, hunger, and uh, the instinct to create uh, in a general sense, the, the instinct to the spiritual instinct. Uh, all of this is flows from the psychic energy. It's, you could say it's the life energy that animates the entire human system. With Jung, it specifically... Uh, relates to the energy that flows through the uh, central nervous system. And, and of course, for Jung, uh, he disagreed. The reason they split was because of his disagreement about uh, this energy being uh, reducible simply to the sex drive. So uh, if we're going to talk about uh, the goal for healthy individuals, it's going to be this ongoing, focused, free flow of this psychic energy, of this psychological energy. And uh, in order, and this is part of uh, something we'll get into when we talk about the individuation process in general, the first phase of the individuation process is to differentiate from the unconscious, separate from the parents, and develop a strong ego structure. We often think, well, we want to break down the ego and, and, and get in touch with the unconscious, but if we do that before we've develop a strong ego structure, then the ego can be overwhelmed by the unconscious. So we want to have a strong energy structure so that we can focus the energy coming from the unconscious towards uh, the various creative projects. When the energy is blocked, uh, you can have psychological problems or physical problems or all kinds of things. So a lot of the work we do in psychology is trying to simply uh, get that energy moving. Now when it comes to, as I was saying, uh, the second term on my list there was healing. So how does creativity relate to healing? Well, Jung found that simply releasing the creative energy can be enormously healing for the individual. Creative activity can release some of the unconscious energy that's animated. Uh, I got my turn off my phone. Um, it it uh, can release some of this unconscious energy that animates various symptoms. And so I love this cartoon because it kind of shows just the basic uh, sense of how art therapy can work on its on its just most obvious level. This uh, character's got all this chaos in his psyche. Uh, he begins to draw exactly that chaos onto the paper, and simply by doing that, it's released, and he has a sense of relief. So that's just kind of the simple, basic uh, aspect of of the healing process of being creative and being able to turn what has been a blockage into something that just at least just gets it out of the system. And Jung saw, even when he was working with people uh, and started doing active imagination, even if they didn't do, go any further than to write things down, write down words or draw or uh, any of the number of different ways. He, he had people dance, he had people play music, he had all these different approaches. Art was, was very much a prominent one, but he found that it helped them. It helped the, it alleviated the symptoms, whether they were able to uh, interpret or uh, understand what they were doing. Just by doing it, uh, people felt better and, and it alleviated some of the systems, uh, symptoms. So, um, again, going back to that list, the third thing I want to talk about is craft. And uh, craft, I relate to the the, this is a, a sort of a diagram of the Jungian psyche. You've probably seen something like it or maybe the same diagram. The ego uh, has to separate from the unconscious, and we need to develop a strong ego, and as we do that, we develop a persona. 
which is the mask that we use to deal with the social group and uh, first with the family and then later with the social group and craft is related in my mind to this idea of developing a skill and it, it's kind of parallel to developing a strong ego structure if someone's going to create art they need to work on the skill the craft of whatever if you're a musician you need to be able to play certain scales certain chords certain uh, structure of the uh, piece you're doing it uh, artist needs to know about color and canvas and paints and on and on the the craft of putting together a chair or something like that you, anybody can put together a chair if they know the constituent parts and know the tools required uh, that's a craft and it's really very much to the same thing of adapting to a social group uh, it's that focused conscious energy that allows uh, someone to use that craft to create something. Uh, now, fourth, is on my list of uh, of things is that when this focused energy we talked about the creative energy or this what I'm calling the psychic energy is parallel to this creative energy. When this creative energy, this focused energy arising from the unconscious, is mediated by a strong enough ego in relation to a social group. In other words, there's, there's somebody out there who wants uh, a particular uh, artistic product, and uh, this energy is coming out of the unconscious. There's a, enough craft has been developed, and a concrete material product is created in response both to the outer stimuli and the inner stimuli of the energy coming through the, the uh, psyche, then we could call that art. It's not simply craft, and I'm going to go into a lot more detail on all these. I just want to kind of lay it out. Uh, it's 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 more there's a little more energy to it than in simply craft although it can't be done without craft uh, but it's it's also not uh, quite as uh, quite as dynamic as this fifth level so if kind of echoing the same idea if this focused energy is arising from the unconscious and it's doing so in a compensatory way it's compens compensating for something going on out in the culture and it may be compensating for something that the artists themselves are completely unconscious of uh, and certainly the social group would be unconscious of it but when this uh, the the movement coming out of the psyche isn't just simply the ongoing uh, psychological energy that's always flowing but if it's particularly uh, and usually it will be in somehow related to a uh, a, uh, a complex which we'll, we'll get more into that in a minute too but as that energy is coming up if it's taking a specific archetypal form either through a complex or through some other manifestation in the psyche of the artist but it's, it's clearly a, a strong archetypal form that's compensating something in the culture when this archetypal form is stewarded by a strong enough ego and sometimes the ego is almost strong enough and it breaks down we it's a cliche to think of uh, the madness in, in, in an artist, someone who just either succumbs to drugs or succumbs to something because the ego hasn't been quite strong enough, but they manage to get some of this archetypal energy out and create some great art, and then uh, they disappear one way or another. So if that ego is strong enough, though, and uh, it's in relation to a social group compensating something that's going on in, in the culture, uh, and with all that, it's, it's able to express itself in a way that uh, creates a concrete material product, then we would call this high art, or this is what I'm going to call high art. And this art will likely be transformative, not only for the artist, but for the social and cultural group. Unfortunately, many times it takes decades or even centuries for the social group to recognize the transformative importance of this artistic product. Someone like Van Gogh, uh, he, he he didn't have craft in the uh, traditional sense. A lot of his perspectives were off. His his use of paint was uh, a lot of people thought it was very sloppy. He was in a culture where uh, Ram, Rembrandt was the you know the great Dutch artist, and he was uh, you know brown and dark colors and very realistic. And here comes Van Gogh with you know splashes of color, thick 
the paint is, is sometimes you know a quarter of an inch or half an inch off the canvas it's so thick and bright with colors and swirling and it, it, the underlying forms aren't always really very realistic whereas Rembrandt uh, was always very realistic but he was compensating something that was missing in the culture and in Rembrandt and uh, very I don't think he sold more than one or two paintings in, in his lifetime and those I think were uh, you know because of his brother but the point being that still uh, even now we see those paintings and they, they can be transformative for people hundreds of years later uh, clearly there was some sort of I'm, I'm saying from a Jungian point of view that there was some sort of archetypal energy flowing there so uh, with this in mind uh, I want to talk a little bit about the the uh, individuation process and get back to uh, again how this whole way of thinking of creativity fits in with Jung's ideas. Now, the basic, uh, and the, but yeah, the basic individuation process itself, as I said, in uh, it's not often looked at. Yolanda Jacobi, uh, who is very close to Jung, articulates it this way, and uh, and it's something I find helpful that there are two phases, and one is the development of a strong ego, and the second is Get, making sure that the ego either remains in touch or gets back in touch with the deep instinctual nature of the psyche. So this is a set of diagrams from uh, Edward Edinger and uh, his book Ego and Archetype. And he he cites in that book uh, f first uh, getting the the term ego self axis from Eric Neumann's book on the child. But uh, the idea is that the individuation process is about differentiating. You see this first figure one, the ego is completely encased in the self. Uh, archetypally, this is, as I say, this is uh, often represented in uh, creation myths of someone, something breaking through somewhere and something uh, emerging and uh, out of the depths or out of something. Uh, but this is, you could also say the, the child encased in the mother, little bit by little bit, the ego differentiates from the self and oftentimes uh, as we have in modern times very often uh, the ego differentiates but this ego self axis this thing that keeps the ego in, con in contact with the self is not there and then we have complete dissociation and uh, some kind of uh, tragedy usually results from that uh, I won't go into too much detail about that but that's the Jungian idea is that we want to maintain that ego self axis. The way it's been done traditionally through uh, the centuries has been through religious practice. The, the self would be projected onto and represented in whatever the object of worship was, and the ego would be remain in connection with the archetype of the self through these religious uh, exercises of, of connecting oneself either through prayer or worship of some kind, even just going to uh, a sort of dogmatically institutionalized form, if it manages to, to grip the individual, then that ego self-axis can be maintained. In modern times, as Jung would say over and over again, uh, the religious, because we've learned so much about the universe, the old 2,000 and 3,000, 4,000 year old explanations cease to work for us. And that's why he says we need depth psychology to help us find means and ways to maintain this uh, connection between the ego and the self. So this structure that I was talking about, uh, you know, that emerges as we go through this process of differentiating uh, the structure, some of the structures, and I'll go through some of them. As I say, many of them you may be quite aware of, but uh, the ego differentiates from the unconscious and. Uh, I'll say a little bit about complexes later, but uh, with every complex, there is, according to Jung's definition, uh, there is an archetypal core, which is surrounded by um, feeling-toned uh, associations that have to do with the, the personal life story of the individual. So there's an archetype, which is universal, there, and there is some associated ideas that are usually around a trauma or so and, and, and of course complexes 
everybody has a mother complex, everybody has a father complex. It's not necessarily, we tend to think of it as being pejorative, but the complex can be a very positive complex. The ego is a complex, the persona is a complex. Uh, the What I'm prefacing, uh, saying all this to preface the idea that the archetype at the core of the ego complex is the archetype of the self and the ego differentiates but has to have that connection to the self or it's going to go off the rails somewhere so in the structure we have the as i've mentioned before the persona which uh, is how we mediate ourselves to the uh, family group and then later the social group we have an area of consciousness which the ego is the center of consciousness then we have for jung the personal unconscious of course uh, for Freud, that was all there was. He said there's personal conscious and then the id. But for Jung, the deep unconscious, what Freud would call the id, was also structured. Uh, the archetype of the self being the center of all that and the center of all the teeming energy that, that is stewarded by the other archetypes. But uh, there's a personal unconscious, which the ego is sometimes aware of sometimes things fall into the personal unconscious by neglect sometimes they're actively repressed but they will still carry lots of energy that if we're not in touch with them that energy is not available to us and if they're locked up in a complex uh, the energies the deep energies of the unconscious are generally stewarded by archetypes and if there's an archetype in the core of a complex that's not being worked out that energy will not be available to us until we can kind of work through it with those complexes. So as we're developing, the and these pictures are uh, from uh, 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 Esther Harding's book, The I and the Not I. Uh, wonderful book, uh, lays out a lot of these basic ideas, uh, but her, her diagrams are particularly uh, evocative. So as we develop the persona, there are certain things we necessarily don't want to uh, be known to that we don't want to have a part of our interaction with the social group and so either through neglect or active repression uh, they go into the unconscious and they tend to uh, crystallize around a figure that Jung called the shadow this is one of the first this is typically in the it's a complex it's typically in the Personal unconscious, although like all complexes, it has an archetypal core. This is one of the archetypes that we do not want to uh, mediate and we do not want to make conscious in any way. We want to work out the shadow things so we bring light into them. We don't want to uh, integrate the uh, archetypal core, which is pure archetypal evil. Um, you can see in this diagram there's, there's uh, the sense of projection and how we will project the shadow onto other people, typically... There'll be something about ourselves that we don't want to recognize that we see in someone else and project the shadow onto that person. Just even deeper than the shadow, uh, Jung says, is the the anima and animus, which is, it's, it's more difficult to talk about the anima and animus these days because when Jung was talking, there were very clearly defined gender stereotypical roles and he's talking in those terms. Uh, today, gender roles are so fluid that uh, it sounds like it's uh, an, an anachronism and it's out of date. Uh, I think to stick strictly to those uh, kind of um, traditional ideas of gender roles is perhaps out of date, not for everyone, but for many people it'd be out of date. But the idea that below the shadow there is some sort of gender identity figure that acts as a sort of a boundary between the deep collective unconscious and the personal unconscious and i'm not going to get into uh, psychological types but there's always a, an inferior function the type that is the, the function of the psyche that is least used and that will be reflected very much through the anima animus figure so i'm going to just describe this in terms of the traditional roles and then say a little bit about why that's not always uh ideal so um if a man is I identified with a traditional masculine role he's going to have an unconscious traditional feminine figure as an anima likewise a woman identified with traditional gender stereotypical feminine role uh gender role 
then she's going to have a typical uh, gender stereotype masculine figure as her animus. Now, with gender roles mixed up, you would say, well, that doesn't work. No, but the idea is that whatever we are identified with as a conscious gender role, the opposite is going to be the anima or animus. And that's that's just kind of the most I can say about that. And I don't want to, I've got a lot more to get to, but just for people who aren't quite aware of this, this is a part of the individuation process is slowly trying to, Jung says the anima animus are some of the most difficult things uh, to make conscious. They're most of the work we do in psychotherapy, most of the work, if you're a counselor yourself, most of the work you'll do with people is going to be on shadow work and on the personal unconscious. But an awareness of these things is, is really essential to kind of understand where energy is and how the energy is moving. But these, uh, anyways, there's a lot to say about anima and animus and how important they are and how they appear in dreams and how they will carry the inferior function. I'll just leave it at that for now. Now, uh, as I say, the anima animus tend to be on the boundary between the personal unconscious, which is uh, indicated here in the dark side of this individual psyche uh, picture here. Uh, but you see below that are the, the archetypal forms of the anima animus, because the anima animus has our own personal experience of these gender roles and our own personal history mixed up with these archetypal roles of uh, the anima animus which are, you know, as we go deeper down, connected to the great mother and the great father, and then deeper down in the psyche, they're connected to the gods as energy, and then deeper down, uh, we have this, this instinctual level that's represented by animal gods. And Jung would say that in, uh, in dreams and things like that, when we see an animal figure, it tends to be an instinctual uh, a representation of the instincts, and it's much harder to make it conscious. As we follow a series of dreams, if that animal morphs into somewhat more human figure, uh, that's an indication that it, it may be something that we'll be able to assimilate consciously because it's now in a human form. We can't assimilate, uh, ideally, an animal, uh, an instinctual, pure instinct. So that's just one way to read the dreams. Um, now, in the core of that, if you go down deeper, you've got these abstract forms of the opposites and, and the sort of geometrical shapes. And then at the bottom here, again, this is uh, Harding's representations. This is um, the pure archetype of the self and the pure archetypal energy that, that energizes all of these archetypes and gives us our energy. And uh, ideally, this energy is mediated through all these things. This would be the pure creative energy mediated through all these forms, this structured psyche, and I'm going into this detail because to show that this psyche is structured and as we're working on creative projects and all that, when we see certain forms emerge, we can understand uh, a little bit of how the creative spirit and the creative energy is flowing out. And when we're able to or always work in a certain area, uh, certain archetypal forms always appear in the creative work that we're doing and others don't, uh, we may find that that's an area where we're, uh, where we're blocked, where the energy, the psychological energy is blocked. So again, uh, as this process goes on, little by little, uh, if you think of it as the hero's journey, each time you go through the hero's journey, you're able to differentiate a little bit more, differentiate a little bit more, and the idea being to uh, be as conscious as possible, but always maintaining uh, contact with the roots of our psyche, whether we do it through uh, artistic and creative work, whether we do it through religious practice, whether we do it through um, any kind of a disciplined, organized way of doing active imagination, working with our dreams, working with a the therapist. There's all these many different ways. And Jung, when he worked with people, he was, did everything he could to make sure they were not dependent upon him. This is why he developed active imagination and encouraged, tried to educate his clients on dream work and things because he wanted people to be dependent. He wasn't trying to build a business where he had as many clients as possible. He wanted them to get the work done. Oftentimes people would work with him intensely for a month or two, then they'd go away and be gone all winter and come back the next summer to Zurich and work with him for another couple months and 
uh, this was an ideal for him to is the goal for him was to get people doing that work and it's not work that you finish and you say okay I'm cured I'm done that energy is always teeming through the psyche so the way this uh, so in other words it, we want to always be doing creative uh, engagement with the psyche because that is going to keep that energy flowing and not only keep symptoms at bay but keep us uh, productive and keep us uh, as being healthy people who have this connection to the deep instinctual self. So, like I said, during the first phase of the individual pro individuation process, the individual goes through the process of socialization during which the persona is developed as a mask that aids us in interacting with the social group and simultaneously forms what Jung called the shadow in the personal unconscious. For the artist, whether an apprentice or one working in a commercial venture, the persona becomes a part of the toolkit of the artist in the same way that our craft that we develop uh, becomes part of the toolkit. So I said earlier that we would want to associate the idea of craft with the persona. Craft is going to be the skill that an artist develops in order to create art for others, whether it's uh, doing a... Uh, a little knick-knack. I have a friend who's a wonderful art, really brilliant artist, but he makes a living by making little, uh, he's very skillful at making beautiful jewelry, and he sometimes will make mobiles for the foyers of, of big corporations in Chicago and things like that, and he goes around to different craft shows, and, but, you know, he, he can do his own art on the side, but he's also developed this sense of business where he can do things that are just purely craft and, uh, no one's going to put them in the, the Louvre or in the Smithsonian because they're great art, but he's developed a great craft uh, that allows him to, um, to survive quite well. So, however, when an artist is driven by an unconscious content, typically the product of a complex, then greater possibilities emerge than simply uh, craft, than simply being able to know where the colors go and where the lines go and all that. Uh, it's helpful to know those things. Uh, usually, it just, it just as you need a strong ego structure to mediate the energies coming from the psyche, you need to have strong craft in order to mediate a really true work of art, in order to create something that's not only um, precise and, and well rendered, but it's got this charge of uh, psychological energy with it. So in order to regulate and manage unconscious energies, uh, we want to be able to mediate it through our craft and through our art. So the artist must have the necessary skill and require, that's required to shape the emerging content, the, the, the content, the archetypal content, or just the, the psychological energy that's coming out of the psyche, the, whether it's a complex or whatever. And typically, there will be something of the individual artist in the work but it also reflects back to us something that we already know. Usually with art, it's something we already know. Uh, the way I'm kind of making these discrete categories. The difference between simply creating art that's highly charged with this archetypal energy uh, is that simple art that I'm describing here is something we already know, whereas when we get to what I'm calling high art, that would be something that is something that we don't already know. So when a great individual who has access to considerable skill and craft and is able to mediate archetypal energies as they emerge from the unconscious and shape them into something uh, that resembles his or her subjective vision and it somehow is compensatory not just for his own psyche but he's identified enough with the culture and often in a deep way he's compensating something in the culture something that's lacking in the culture itself and, and the the artist uh, t will provide in the same way that a, Jung would say that a dream will provide um, the compensation for the conscious attitude the work of art will provide the compensation for of the uh, conscious attitude of the culture and that which is missing will begin to emerge in great works of art and will have a transformative impact not only on the artist but will have a, ultimately maybe not immediately but will ultimately have a transformative impact on the culture itself because it's brought something to the culture that has been previously unavailable. So this brings us not only to the archetypal level of art but to the archetypal level of the creative process itself. Jung's work suggests that the creative process itself is not just 
uh, an archetypal uh, dimension. It doesn't have it. Not only has an archetypal dimension, but it has an archetypal basis. So there's this idea of this the psyche being structured gives us um, points us in the direction of saying that the creative process itself, the creative act itself, is uh, itself archetypal, and it's a it's a way that people get to know themselves and the way the reason it's revelatory to us is because it's reflecting back the processes that we unconsciously or intuitively recognize uh, are going on in us all the time now in terms of it being archetypal there are many clues to this uh, archetypal dimension not only Jung but Charles Darwin and many others noted that uh, the artistic nature of many of the mating behaviors of animals can be traced this is I forget the name of this uh, this bird, but it's a particular, oh, it's a bower bird, uh, an Australian bower bird. You, the, this little arrangement of the, you see the arrangement of the grass and the arrangement of the flowers. This is all part of the mating process of the bower bird. It, it's, it's really a work of art that this bird has created in order to attract a female. Now, a Freudian would say that this is proof of the sexual nature of the libido, but Jung questions this, as do others. Jung, uh, he doesn't doubt that the origins of these behaviors come from uh, the sexual instinct, but he says that there's no way you can attribute it to that alone. And uh, now the textbook for our course that's coming up is this book, um, Jung on Art by Ty Vandenberg. And in this book, uh, he says this, he says, certainly in the animal world, the art drives services within the realm of mating. However, it is the libido behind the mating, the psychic energy in general, which brings the music into play during mating. And in this case, he's, he's referring to something that Jung says uh, specifically about uh, bird songs and mating and all that. And this is something that uh, Jung says in the book Symbols of Transformation. And in that book, Jung says, although there can be no doubt that music originally belonged to the reproductive sphere, it would, and he's talking about in bird song particularly, it would be an unjustified and fantastic generalization to put music in the same category as sex. Such a view would be tantamount to, cre to treating the Cologne Cathedral in a textbook of mineralogy on the ground that it consists very largely of stones. Just because it's made of stones doesn't mean that that's all that's being represented there in the cathedral. There's something very, very, very different uh, both the artist uh, who created it and the, the craftsman and the, the vision of it clearly is, is uh, communicating something much more than sex, if it's communicating sex at all. So there's a whole lot more to say about the evolutionary, the evolutionary roots of the creative process. Uh, some of this can be seen, as I said earlier, in the creation myths of various cultures. Uh, but what, what I've said here should be enough to kind of familiarize us with some basic groundings in that idea. The important thing to us is how human beings have adapted the creative process in various ways. One of the earliest examples that we've seen can be found in uh, prehistoric cave paintings and early human artistic creations. And these artistic creations are often associated and often began with or certainly were developed in more uh, dynamic and certainly transformative forms in the world of shamans uh, and shamanism. There's a, one researcher, he's, he was very criticized, but really he has a wonderful book called uh, Shamanism, the Beginnings of Art, uh, Andreas Lomel. And he makes the claim that all human art can be traced to the activities of early shamans. And I, again, there's, there's he, he makes a lot of those kind of leaps that uh, intellectuals uh, get very cross about because he, like Jung, he's very intuitive, but I think he makes some very, very good points. And he says, for example, the Australian Aborigines described the time of creation as the dream time. The first beings dreamed the animals and plants. They painted the dream images on rocks, filled them with soul force, and from the rock paintings, the souls of the beings represented spread over the world in a physical shape. The dream represents the creative condition. Certain people, the shamans, are able to put themselves in this creative state and in it to perform acts that are impossible to ordinary mortals. And we can see in this a sort of an archetype of the artist. And depending on the culture, you know, in our time, 
uh, you know, maybe a celebrity actor or a, a rock musician or something is, is this uh, magical being who can perform acts that are impossible for ordinary mortals. But it's a sort of an archetypal form that we can see starting in the early times of, uh, of human uh, activities. And we can take the term dream time and see that as uh, sort of the creative condition. This is what Jung would call the unconscious. You enter the dream time means you enter the unconscious. This is what Jung would say. And when in this state of communion with the unconscious, the shaman is able to create art, something that ordinary mortals are unable to do. And this is this business of dropping into the unconscious, but without l losing the connection to the uh, structured uh, intellectual uh, ego structure that's strong enough to mediate that energy. So in addition to seeing evidence of evolutionary roots of the creative process in animal behaviors, we can also see the development of the creative process in human beings. And through the work of shamans and early artistic people, we see that shamanism in the beginnings of the relationship between the creative process and the dialogue with the unconscious. This is getting back to that same thing. The shaman will fall into a trance and then do a particular act. And likewise, there's a sort of a trance state that uh, the artist gets into when they enter into their uh, creative process. So uh, we may well ask, why is it important uh, that creativity has archetypal and evolutionary roots? And uh, the point is that it begins to give us, for any psychological theory these days to have real uh, solid grounding, it has to be grounded in, in evolution. And Jung, as time goes on, none of the other, uh, no, the other psychological theories have these kind of roots in evolutionary process that, that Jung has. Evolutionary psychiatry is a big thing right now, but Jung was 100 years ahead of them, almost literally. Uh, well, now I guess it is literally. Um, so uh, I want to... I'm going to have to speed through it a little bit because we're getting uh, towards the end of the hour. But uh, there's a wonderful quote from Eric Neumann's book, Art and the Creative Unconscious. And all these things are things I'm going to go into a lot more detail in in the course. But uh, he discusses the uh, importance of having an awareness of the archetypal nature of the creative process because uh, there's both opportunity, transformative opportunity, and there's dangers, and as I say, the dangers are related to this idea of not being able to uh, sustain the influx of these profoundly powerful archetypal energies. So this is Neumann. He says, quote, Every transformative or creative process comprises stages of possession. To be moved, captivated, spellbound, signify to be possessed by something. And without such a fascination and the emotional tension connected with it, no concentration, no lasting interest, no creative process are possible. Every possession can justifiably be interpreted either as a one-sided narrowing or as an intensification and deepening. The exclusivity and radicality of such a possession represents both an opportunity and a danger. So he's talking about going into the creative process and he's emphasizing that if you don't have a strong enough ego structure, this one-sided narrowing can be very dangerous and an unstable person will be overwhelmed and uh, succumb to various compulsions and symptoms and who knows what all. So he goes on to say, but no great achievement is possible if one does not accept this risk though the notion of acceptance of the risk implied in the hero myth presupposes far more freedom than the overpowered ego actually possesses. In other words, this is, you may have heard Jung saying that uh, a complex is, or an archetype is like a crocodile. You don't say that uh, you have the crocodile, the crocodile has you. The crocodile comes up and grabs you and the same thing with the archetype, the same thing with this, uh, you know, what we're talking about is these more powerful, great uh, creative uh, processes begin with being grabbed by this unconscious energy. And he goes on to say, the workings of the autonomous complexes, this is the uh, parallel to the crocodile here, the workings of the autonomous complexes presuppose a disunity of the psyche. 
whose integration is an endless process. And this is what I was saying for Jung, we don't stop doing this work. We continually do it because there's a, a constantly a disunity of the psyche. There's always going to be a need for the integration of these autonomous complexes. He goes on, the world and the collective unconscious in which the individual lives are fundamentally beyond his mastery. In other words, the world is the objective world outside. The collective unconscious is what Jung called the objective psyche and the objective unconscious. We're constantly trying to mediate these two worlds which we can never master. We can never completely master the outer world. We can never completely master the inner world. The most he can do, Neumann says, is to experience and integrate more and more parts of them, little by little, little by little, integrating more and more. But the unintegrated factors are not only a cause for alarm, they are also the source of transformation. And uh, this is a, a lovely, he's got this lovely book, The Art, Art and the Creative Unconscious, and my favorite uh, article, and that is towards the end, uh, it's, I think it's called uh, The Creative Man and Transformation, uh, but uh, well worth looking at. And and we go into a lot of that in the, the course. Um, so I think it's important that he, let me see, yeah, I've got a few minutes left. So it's, it's important that he mentions here the hero's journey. Uh, earlier I quoted from Jung's book, Symbols of Transformation, and it's in this book that Jung first used the mythology of the hero as a model for understanding the ego's need to dialogue with the unconscious. Later, in 1949, Eric Neumann published his book, Origins in History of Consciousness, which uh, traces the same thing in a little more elaborate way. Joseph Campbell, also in 1949, published his book, also uh, very much inspired by Jung's Symbols of Transformation, his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Both of these books expand on Jung's ideas about the hero, and although the hero's journey is described by Campbell is often used to demonstrate aspects of the individuation process, I think we can also see it as a helpful metaphor for understanding aspects of the creative process. And this, uh, I was talking about complexes, and this diagram here is just kind of using an onion as a uh, as a way to understand uh, a complex that there are surface symptoms, there are associated experiences. Uh, Jung called them feeling tones complexes. So these associated experiences are going to be highly emotionally charged, but at the core, there's always an archetype at the core of the complex. And there's a wonderful book, if you want to know more about complexes, uh, Errol Shalit, uh, in inner city books, uh, has a wonderful book. I, I don't remember the full title, but it's basically on complexes. Uh, highly, highly, highly recommended that book. So, um, whether we're talking about a shaman entering into the dream time, a hero answering the call to adventure and crossing the threshold into the underworld, or a creative person incubating a creative idea, each one is attempting to consciously engage with the unconscious. And I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, Campbell's idea of the hero's journey. Uh, in any case, the idea is to be able to go down into the unconscious uh, through a series of challenges and what have you, experience a very humbling experience of some kind. But in that humbling experience, uh, one is able to uh, have, find the treasure. The treasure in this case, uh, we're thinking about it creatively, is going to be uh, an inspiration or the beginnings of a work of art that we work on and we work on and work on until we able to kind of pull ourselves up out of the depths and then we have a boon that we bring back uh, it says here the return with the elixir it could be the elixir of life it could be uh, some other boon for culture talking about creativity we're talking about some some work of art or some work of it doesn't have to be art I mean I think Jung's collected works for example are quite uh, astounding creative act uh, could be something like that. There's any number of ways that our creative journey into the unconscious can can come back with a boon for the culture. So again, the fruit of this engagement with the unconscious would ideally be what Eric Neumann and Edward Edinger have called creating and maintaining an ego self axis. In other words, it would be something that not only uh, helps to maintain that for the artist, but ideally it's going to be something that points towards that, that somehow helps the people in the culture to maintain their own connection with this uh, instinctual roots of their energy. 
Uh, so this means maintaining an ongoing dialogue with the unconscious, as I've said, listening to the unconscious, responding to the unconscious, and accepting the gifts of the unconscious. Often people don't know why they uh, find a work of art compelling, but uh, it's usually because it's activating something in their own unconscious, and they it allows them access to something that they previously did not have access to. So the success of the shaman's journey, the hero's journey, or the creative endeavor all depend, once again, upon the strength and capability of the ego structure. A weak, ungrounded ego will always be in danger of being overwhelmed by unconscious contents. The shaman, or the hero, or the artist must all learn to live, move, and have their being in the gross physical world and be effective in that world before they try their hand at plumbing the depths of the deep unconscious. You know, one way Jung said that is he said, if, I'm des if my destiny is to go down into a deep hole, I want to have a long rope and a good working flashlight and things like that so that I can make my way around down there. And that's, that's kind of, I would say, his way of saying that I need to have some sort of a sense of grounding in the outer world. He said when he was doing his work, first development, people called it, you know, his, his uh, psychological break. I, I, I argue with that. It's not a... It was, it was a consciously determined endeavor uh, in, the, in 1912, 13, 14, when he was doing his uh, creative work, de developing active imagination. He said what kept him grounded was, A, his uh, family. He had many, many kids and, and a wife and a lot of worldly activities, and he had his patience. And he said those things kept him grounded in the world while he was kind of really floating around deeply in the unconscious and developing what ultimately came to be the, the Jungian psychology that we have today. So finally, uh, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, when we think about the archetypal evolutionary roots of creativity and the creative process, Jung spent the last 20 years or more of his life studying alchemy. And although Jung focused on the ways in which alchemy paralleled the individuation process, we can also see in alchemy how modern people attempted to integrate ancient creative processes with modern discoveries and with rational thought. So alchemy is really an extraordinarily rich resource for us for understanding both the individuation process, which is how Jung used it, but also I feel it helps us to just understand generally the patterns of creativity in human beings and the human psyche and how uh, we attempt to integrate this ancient mythological realm with our modern concrete rational world uh, and there's there's again there's many 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 volumes of Jung and many many things we could say about that but this I think alchemy is one of the great sort of archetypal representations of the creative process and how the creative process works not only in general but particularly for modern people trying to maintain that link between the deep unconscious and the uh, the challenges of modernity and hyper 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 rationality uh, of the world that we live in today so thank you everybody uh, thank you Adele and and the group for asking me to share my thoughts on Jung and creativity I hope I didn't uh, cram too much in there and if I did please I hope we'll have some uh, dialogue and questions and answers and things uh, just to reiterate beginning in October the free course is going to be on the 15th of October uh, in the afternoon uh, through the Depth Psychology Academy. It's www.depthpsychologyacademy.com. You can sign up through there. It's a nine-week course if you include the uh, free introductory class, which is going to be pretty similar to what I've been doing today. Um, but it's also going to go much more deeply into creativity and individuation and art and transformation, art and the great individual, as well as creativity, art, and culture and all everything I've been saying here uh, is is from what, what we'd call a classical Jungian perspective. There's a lot of developments have happened that are beyond the classical Jungian perspective, but uh, I stick pretty much with that. When I when I branch out, I go more to uh, Edinger and uh, one of my favorites, um, uh, uh, Anthony Stevens, uh, his his book um, uh, Archetype and Natural History of the Self is uh, something that I really uh, like very much and use a lot in, in descriptions of things. I think he's moved in a direction that Jung would like to move. So that's that's it for what I have, uh, and I like hope very much that uh, somebody has 
comments, questions, con contributions. Uh, I don't know how we mediate this, but whatever. I can put it in the chat also if you're shy about speaking or maybe unmute yourself and ask a... What was the name of the book on complexes? It's it's by Errol Shalit, S-H-A-L-I-T. And it's, um, I think it's, it's the comp... I mean, I could go back to my bookshelf and find it maybe, but it might take a while. Um, but it, it's... So if someone wants to look it up, it's it's made by uh, Inner City Books, uh, rather published by Inner City Books. It's the only book by Errol Shalit, S H A L I T, uh, on in on the Inner City Books catalog uh, that's on complexes. So I don't know exactly what the title is, but uh, if you email me or you know I can email it to if we don't figure it out in the next couple of minutes, uh, email me James R Newell at gmail.com and I'll I'll send you the title and all the all the information. Um, it's just called the complex. The complex, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's a subtitle too, but that's all you need is the complex, yeah. Thanks. Any thoughts? Anyone? I know somebody's got a thought, so if they're somewhere. I can say something. Yes. Um yeah, great talk. I, I there's Thank you. so it was so rich that I'm 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 thinking uh, a lot about what you said. Um what comes to mind right away though was that last slide uh, about alchemy. Mm -hmm. And uh during your talk I was thinking about alchemy and um what a great metaphor that is for the creative process. Um I love the idea of uh take, you know, the artistic process uh, especially the heart, high art artistic process of taking lead uh, and turning it into gold, uh, which is what a lot of great artists do. They take the sort of detritus or the the things that are most unconscious in the culture mm -hmm. and elevate them, uh, kind of like... Uh, uh, like uh, I, I think of the Alfred Hitchcock quote that uh, the worst books make the best movies. Um, you know, he he would take uh, just you know pulpy uh, right. books that were at the supermarket and and turn them into these masterpieces of high art, high film, uh, high art film. And um, you know, George Lucas took the uh, the uh, the sci fi genre, which was mostly except for like Kubrick or you know a few others, was kind of this low budget B picture uh field and and he created you know this innovative thing yeah and they're right now they're doing that with disney they're like expanding that but it's it's basically cowboy you know it's the the old cowboy uh you know there's a hero and then there's there's a fight and there's an enemy and all that uh and you know then he very much influenced by campbell of course but uh yeah they the the thing that um that's different about, I mean, you, when you said they, they turn lead into gold, the thing, thing, thing that's different um, with high art particularly is that, again, it, it, with craft, it's from the top down. I say, I think I would like to make a chair, and I make a chair, whereas uh, with this, it's like I have to make the most, I have to make something, there's something, suddenly I'm obsessed with the idea of either a chair or some, not just a chair, but it's going to be a throne, and it's going to have, all, you know, that's, that's when you know something's happening when you're just possessed by it from within rather than uh just coming up with an idea but now sometimes someone can come up with an idea and then that will stimulate the internal part but there's that there has to be a little of both yeah 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 thank you sure no thanks for that uh uh contribution and i i agree that there's i could have done a whole thing and i will do more in the course but a whole thing on creativity and the and, and alchemy but the Jung, there's, there's a thing where particularly Jungians tend to think of alchemy as being about uh, individuation, and for Jung that was very important. But it's 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 an archetype. It's it's an archetype, and it's about process, and that's what makes it kind of applicable to I think any human creative process uh, in terms of the the levels that that we have to go through and the 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 different uh, ways that we have to engage with it. Okay, Michael. Yeah, thanks. Oh, we can't hear you. Michael, unmute yourself, please. Oh. 
Uh, Michael, we can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. There you go. Sorry about that. I started by saying thank you, Dr. Newell. This has been been so informative. Um, and in using the word process, um, last night I went to the uh, Belcourt Theater here in Nashville to see the documentary called on David Bowie called uh, Moon Age Daydream. And it's so clear that his driven nature from a very early time and the process, he comes back to that over and over again of the discipline to work through a set of internal challenges he had and then completely exit from that to some new set and move forward with that. And so that strikes me as such a... a, a um, a profound uh, expression of craft and a boon for the culture and in the ways he moved. But the piece that I want to come back to is that he describes in the end of the documentary um, when he's in his forties that he, he recognizes there's a cost to his process by accepting that there's an audience that wants to hear what he has to say. And he, he begins to say, and I sort of allowed myself to enjoy the fact that there was an audience that wanted to hear myself. However, I felt in those later years, my process, my process, my creative changes were not as up to the depth that he wanted to see with them. And it, so it strikes me as a rather, rather impressive, I think the film's a little over long, but it, it, it captures what you've been speaking about well and that's the thing that's uh, he would have to in order to um to maintain a process that's that's being driven from within he would have to sacrifice the adulation of his uh, you know or, and, and probably the happiness of his record company as well because he wants to or his promoters or whatever because they it would interfere with that thing and that's the it's something about calling when people talk about calling they say, well, I feel called to do such and stuff. And, and, and well, you may feel called to be a brain surgeon, but uh, no one's going to call you to be a brain surgeon until you develop the craft of being a brain surgeon. And you have to, there has to be an outer call that, mm -hmm. that, that somehow corresponds with the inner call. And now it doesn't have to be to be a great artist. Someone like, uh, as I said, Van Gogh is a classic mm -hmm. example, that uh, he was called to be an artist and he was a great artist, but... There was no, there was no call outside of him to, that that responded to it. it. There is now. He, if he could get the payment then that he was getting now, he he probably would have stopped painting after the first couple of paintings once he got his twenty million dollars or something. So there's a, there's weird trade offs with these things. There's a lot of people who, uh, you see it all the time in the entertainment world with someone that'd be very very brilliant and do great work, and then as soon as they hit, their their work suffers enormously because they're they're now in the the gears of the of the machinery. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Well, I'm curious. I I know that there's a lot of artists and creative types here listening to to you today, Dr. Noel. And if any of them want to share um, sort of their journey, you know, as far as what possessed them, you know, what, you know, these, uh, I absolutely agree that it is a drive. I'm, that's always on my intake forms as a therapist. What kind of creativity do you do? And, and if you don't, let's explore that, you know, so it's, it's so imperative. <clears throat> but I'd like to hear from the creative types who are here, if you'd like to share sort of what was that possession initially for you? Uh, and if no one else, <laughs> I'll put Michael on the spot. Michael, if um, if people don't know, you are a filmmaker. And, uh, of course, uh, the sort of iconic Matters of the Heart film, uh, you uh, that was your film. So um, do you want to share or anyone else? I can make a few, few little notes about that. Um, uh, Matter of Heart really began with the with the artist Sam Francis, and Sam Francis getting together with James Kirsch, who was one of the founders. Hilda and James Kirsch founded the Los Angeles Jung Institute, and and Sam, there had been an idea to do a documentary and to try to capture the folks who had worked with Jung, and Kirsch was against it, and then he threw an I Ching. 
And that completely changed his mind. What came out of the I Ching was, yes, go ahead and do this. And so, so a matter of heart started with the, um, with the artistic energy and also the, 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 uh, the drive from Suzanne Wagner at the Los Angeles Jung Institute. And in those days, I used to record uh, lectures at, uh, that, at the LA Jung Institute and Ed, Edward Edinger was one of the folks I used to record on numerous times and actually worked with him as, as, a, uh, with him as an analyst for a while. But um, I, I think I, I see a number of, of of, of musicians who are, are with us today. Um, and I guess it would say, tie, tie back to David Bowie. It certainly wasn't an easy existence. And he, I, I understand, really had two marriages that really, really didn't stay for long. There are two children, but, 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 but a tormented soul. So not, and you talked about that very well, that sometimes uh, the, somebody loses their life in it, but uh, I would certainly say that that Bowie seemed to evidence a, a very strong ego and capability to move. In fact, he's rather self-centered in all the pictures about him. But, but he certainly was a magic in that boon for the culture of magic and how he captured such inner feelings, it strikes me. Yeah, and uh, he, he had both the... Uh, it's so hard for someone in that... I mean, so many artistic people just shun the idea of being disciplined of being a journeyman being a discipline get mm -hmm. up in the morning and do that and get in the morning and do that and the great writers all all say that they you know may only work for an hour every day but uh, but they do it every single day mm -hmm. and uh, to be, to be able to do that and uh, be responding to a culture who has a need for something related to what you're doing and being able to I mean there are people who Again, from the top down, we'll see, ah, oh, they need widgets. I'm going to make widgets. And that, that's a kind of a craft thing. But there's another thing where you, you, you've you got this drive and, and you see where it intersects with the culture. And then you can get, and he seemed to, to really have that, where he really saw where other people often didn't. Oftentimes, the, the art that really is going to break through, whether commercially or just resonating with people, is exactly the thing that uh, people hear about this in Nashville all the time. They're proud of the... Uh, this song was rejected twenty hundred times. You know, it's like the more it's rejected, it's almost like it's it, you're you're showing people something that they're they're trying to not let into the culture. And if when it finally breaks through, people just go crazy about it. Is there anyone else? Linda. Linda. Yeah, I have to unmute. Um. I was, that's such a great question uh, that you asked, Dr. Newell, about, or Karen, that you asked. I'm not sure who I asked it about. Um, what What's the prompt? What's the call uh, to engage in a creative process? And I, I'm thinking, for me, uh, writing has been such a powerful thing. And I think that, you know, it becomes like, like active imagination in a way, or like, dream work because if you have a skillful facilitator mm. who knows how to mm. um, prime the well that people fall down into mm. then what comes out of your pen is is a revelation it isn't something you manufactured it's something that comes to tell you something and mm. um, then that becomes worth sharing with other people Absolutely. The, 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 the other trick about that is that some people depend so much on that voice coming up that when the voice stops coming up, they have a nervous breakdown and they, they can't write. They, you know, they talk about writer's block and they can't. But there are other people who the voice suddenly comes up. Well, the hell with it. I, I know how to put words. I'm going to keep writing anyways. And they keep writing and, and they may trash it all. But eventually something will resonate with that and it just some people seem to be able to manage that and other people will go into a crisis if if the voice seems to have shut up you know i think that has to do with whether you're trying to write something mm -hmm. for a purpose or you know to make yeah. a living versus in my case it was more like putting myself in a situation where yeah writing would happen i wasn't trying to write a book or trying to produce anything uh, many years into that process, it became a book because it became a, 
compilation of things that had happened in that way. Um, but yes, I, can, I think it's a whole different thing if you identify as a writer and that's what you do for a living and you have to produce something, you know. <laughs> Didn't Jean Rafa have a hand up? Yeah, yeah, I did. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, for, for me, it, the calling came when I was 10 years old mm -hmm. and in a dream. Mm -hmm. And in the dream, my hero, the Lone Ranger, shot me. <laughs> uh, and Tonto said, come see the Lone Ranger. I'm on the railroad tracks and Tonto calls me back. I go, there's the Lone Ranger, there's Tonto. And the Lone Ranger shoots me and I woke up screaming and my mother said, it's okay, it's just a dream. And I said, I am 10 years old and I will never forget this. This is not just a dream. This just happened to me, you know? And and what that did is uh, it, I pretty much forgot about it over the years um, until I joined a Jungian center point group. And in the very first class, we were asked to tell a dream and I told that dream and I and my heart started pounding and my hands started shaking and my tears were I'm heaving, trying not to, you know, start bawling. And I thought, oh, my word, this is just huge. There's something going inside of me and I don't know what it is. And what I eventually realized as I started working on my dreams, immediately ordered 20 books from inner city books, started writing all my dreams down every night, you know, seven dreams a night sometimes, and recording them and working on them. And over the years, I gradually realized that um, my father was a policeman. He divorced my mother and then he had a heart attack. So he betrayed me and the Lone Ranger betrayed me and he was a policeman. And I, in my, my issue that I write about in my books is about feeling um, like a victim in a patriarchal world. Mm -hmm. And that pretty much gave me my, my theme. And that's what I've been writing about ever since. Mm, lovely. Wow. It's so scary. Yeah, it was scary. <laughs> I'm shaking just talking about yeah. it, you know? Was it a silver bullet that he shot you with? Oh, of course. Of course, yeah. And he wore a mask. He he was a shadow aspect for me of mm. the patriarchy, even though I thought he was a hero, you know, but I was the victim. He was the hero. Well, there's. are you familiar with a book called The Raven? Um, I don't uh, think so. I forget the uh, author and I forget the publisher, but um, it's a wonderful book. And in it, it's about, it, it's about uh, PTSD and, and Vietnam vets. Mm -hmm. And he goes through a number of different stories about PTSD, and and the Lone Ranger is one of the stories he talks about. Because the Lane, the Lone Ranger is a PTSD, uh, you know, a trauma survivor story. He's, he's shot, and they think he's dead, and they bury him, and then he he has to always go around with a mask. And so there's a lot of uh, interesting stuff in that, also in the Lone Ranger. I never knew that, but I think I had some PTSD after my father died, and the Lone Ranger shot me. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, yeah. Well, it, it, yeah. I wonder if, uh, yeah, I would immediately want to see what kind of trauma issues your father might have had. Yeah, they divorced, and uh -huh. yeah, then he had his third heart attack. Ouch. Mm. Yeah, he was a policeman. He worked in the Everglades. He uh, he was on stakeouts for uh, marijuana drops and things, and um, he. I think this his trauma had to do with coming from a very small town, very religious family, and falling in love with another woman early in my parents' marriage. And mm. I think it broke his heart to leave my mother and my brother and me, and he was gone most of the time with her, mm. you know? Yeah. So that's tough. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jean. And I know we've got Jamie and then David Wilson. All right. Thank you. I have a question about aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And do you have a comment about aesthetics and how they play a part in the creative process? And would you think of it only in terms of high art or in our lower art or <laughs> well it's interesting uh jung has a very specific has specific ideas about it. see there's a yeah and there's a whole lot to, uh, to say about all there's so many aspects to art and all that and uh i, I couldn't reproduce it all in uh, my mind 
right now, but there's there's certain functions that uh, come into play. And he talks about aesthetics as being a problem. And see, he talks about, first of all, he's very interested in art for healing. And he talks about, just as an example, and this isn't really, I'm not sure this exactly addresses your question, but it, but it gives you an idea of something about how Jung thought about aesthetics. And he said, for example, you could, uh, someone who is very into aesthetics and into beauty and all that could be walking down a winter snowy street and a car slids, uh, slides and, and, and runs over a young child. A- and a person just involved with aesthetics would say, oh, look at the, the beautiful way the red is flowing on the white snow and, and how the snow is coming down and isn't it beautiful? Well, that's a completely dissociated kind of psycho <laughs> way to perceive that event. But that would be, uh, that would be an aesthetic. So an aesthetic that's, uh, or any function that's, I forget which one of it, it's, it's, it's not, certainly not the feeling, it's certainly sensation, I guess, would be involved in which functions he's talking about are, are involved in a typical uh, sort of dissociated sense of aesthetics. So he, he, as with anything, he's saying that ideally we want all of the functions working, and if the feeling function is in there, you could not simply look at it from an aesthetic uh, perspective and aesthetics, you know, by definition, is is a branch of psychology, or rather philosophy. So it's it's very much involved with the head. So in aesthetics are, and again, it depends on what kind of aesthetics you're interested in. There's a lot of there's a wonderful uh, anthropologist who talks about the uh, well, there's a what the heck's his name? Can't think of the Dewey. I think it's Dewey talks about the aesthetics of experience. Is a philosopher of aesthetics. He talks about the aesthetics of experience and that. And that's kind of bringing it back a little bit more into the body and bringing aesthetics into the idea that everything, we, he, he has a thing he talks about, the everyday aesthetic. And I use the idea of aesthetics in, in a lot of the writing about religious studies that I do because there's this idea that uh, people tend to focus, particularly in religious studies, they, they focus on scripture and they focus on ritual. But mm-hmm. it's really the aesthetic, it's the feeling. A lot of people couldn't give a damn about, uh, you know, the... I know there are people who say, you say, do you believe in such and such? And they say, I don't know, I'll have to ask my pastor. You know, they, they, they go because they like the music. They go because they like the feeling of being in community. They, don't, they really don't even know what the church stands for if they go to a church. They, they're interested in the aesthetic, that, you know, the beauty of the church and all that kind of thing. So there's an aspect of experience that will trump, uh, you know, a sort of a pure aesthetic, which is all about the... Uh, the beauty of, a, of an object or the, the way colors blend and all that that's separate from the aesthetics of experience where, uh, you know, all of your functions, your feeling, your sensation, you know, tactile function, your, your sense of intuitive uh, bonding with other people and all that kind of stuff uh, makes it uh, a little bit different. So does that address any of what you were asking? Yeah, I really appreciate your time, taking time with that. Thank you so much. Sure. Appreciate it. Thanks for asking. We had another hand up somewhere. My, my name is David. Uh, my Hi, first David. time with this group. First time here with this group. Um, I was invited by a member here, um, and uh, um, lots of things that touched me today that I just wanted to. First of all, I was. She's asked if anybody raised their hand who was a musician. And my long, long, long time ago, my undergraduate degree was in music therapy, um, <laughs> and so. Um, but today. Uh, you know, the place where I work in Nashville, we work mainly with folks who, who, who've got dealing with trauma and addiction, among other things. Um, and uh, I mean, a lot of the things that, that you've just mentioned, you know, the aesthetics. Uh, I, I'm one of the things I, I try to incorporate both in my personal life and in my work these days is doing drum circles. And uh, in fact, I gave up going to, to my regular drum circle this afternoon to, to be here today. But, um, you know, I just uh, um, mainly I, I just I'm just expressing my appreciation for this because it's brought me back to some things I haven't really thought about or, or focused on for quite a long time. Um, and uh, especially related to Carl Jung. But um, I did want to chime in to a little bit about the, the, the David, David Bowie movie. Um, I went on Friday night to go see it mm-hmm. and it was really intriguing to me. First of all, yes, he, he was very self-absorbed in a way. I happen to know somebody who used to work with him 
who was a, uh, a guitar tech, and he worked with a lot of bands, traveled with a lot of bands on the road, uh, working on their guitars while they were, you know, touring. And, and but he he emphasized a lot how incredibly caring David was to everybody mm-hmm. that was that he was interacted with at all uh, mm-hmm. people that, you know, that were small and just maybe insignificant, not, not stars and in, involved, but the, the, you know, the crew, the, you know, everybody, he had this way of being very authentically um, mm-hmm. caring. So it's interesting, this dynamic between someone who's very self-absorbed, but at the same time, very giving. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, um, but, and also what was, what was really intriguing to me about the movie was it was made, maybe Michael already mentioned this, but it was, it was if he had made this documentary about himself because of the way that, that, that all of these different art forms in terms of cinematography and, and his paintings and not, and not just his music, but, you know, it was all put together in a way it looked like as if David had actually created this, mm-hmm. this movie about himself, which is was really amazing. So anyway, um, glad to be here. I've joined, I've joined the organization. I'm looking forward to more. Thank you. Thanks, David. Yeah, I'm interested in seeing that movie now. Is this, is this something that's just come out? or? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and David, that's a precious comment you made. You, you get the feeling overwhelmingly from the film that, that David Bowie is a, is, a, is a man who doesn't keep himself aloof from people. And so, but that's really, really beautiful to hear that, that to, to go along with it. Because it, it's, it, to me, it adds to the depth of the struggle he went through himself that came out in his music. And, 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 and it's a struggle that has to do with relationship and compassion for others. And so that's fantastic to have that personal experience you've related. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, it was a really cool, um, moon, moon something, it's, it's called, I'm trying to look it up. Moon Age Daydream. But, uh, moon Age Daydream, yeah, that was, a, that was one of his songs that was not a, a big top seller, but uh, yeah, Moon Age Daydream. Thank you. Thank you for commenting. And is there anyone else that would like to ask a question or make a comment before we wrap up? There's Tiffany has one. Thank Tiffany you. I have, and, a, yeah. I have a practical question about the course. Is it eight weeks or six weeks? It's eight weeks. But it's and also it's you know it's recorded on Zoom. So if you miss one or something, it's it'll be available, you know, in perpetuity pretty much. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for asking, Tiffany. Adele? Uh, you know, I'm, there's so many comments I would like to make. I mean, <clears throat> this is very moving. You did a wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've had the opportunity to live with a whole family of creative people. I, my husband, son, and daughter are all making a living in the arts. So I don't consider myself quite the artist that some of my family members, but just observing them one of the things early on, I think I was projecting onto my songwriter, musician, husband. Oh, what a wonderful thing. If I could only be able to do this. And he pointed out, it took me years to understand. It's uh, it's not only a gift, but it's a burden. It's a burden mm-hmm. and a gift. And so I think I've come to, and I know so many creative people here in Nashville, artists, friends, and musician friends. And uh, i the word that comes to mind to me is bravery or courage. I think it mm-hmm. takes a lot of courage for people to create art. And especially oh, if they put themselves out there that actually try to make a living doing it. Yeah, especially the music industry these days, particularly, it's just so, I mean, in, in any field of the arts, it's just, you're, at, you're really, really kind of at the whim of, of so many different forces. And you have to you have to stay focused on your own vision. And at the same time, You've got to respond immediately to all these different forces outside of you, and and even when you do that, by the time you you know produce your work of art that's aimed at that thing, they've moved on to something else. So it's it's just trying to be ahead of the curve is very very tricky. David, can you tell us about your work as a musician? Uh, yeah, my I mean James. Well, I, and I, I was meaning James, but I, oh, right, 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 no, but both of you. Both. Both of you. <laughs> no, David, go ahead. Oh, I'm, I'm. My 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 playing out in the public is 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 very small. So I'm not. 
uh, most of the stuff that I do is is done in the community sense, like I said, through through music therapy and 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 uh, but not so much in terms of being like a performer. Once in a blue moon, so yeah. Yeah. So uh, just responding to uh, was there another question? No. You. Uh, yeah, so just responding to your question, Michael, about uh, my work as a musician, I, I started playing when I was uh, very, very young, uh, was working professionally by the time I was 15, and I played with a bunch of old blues guys, and uh, with John Lee Hooker and Buddy Guy and Junior Wells and all these uh, great people. We used to tour opening up for Muddy Waters and uh, James Cotton, and uh, well, later when I had my own band, James Cotton would come down and sit in all the time. But... Um, I, it, my, by the time I was probably 24, I mean, when I was 18, I started following a Persian spiritual master named Meher Baba. And I just, everything uh, from that time on, I just uh, love Baba, love Meher Baba. I moved here because there's a spiritual center started here in 1944, founded by him. He came here three times. So it, I say all that just to say that all my music has kind of been around the Meher Baba community. I'm kind of a, I'm like the most famous Meher Baba singer and the way you know, I go to India and play for people there and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that really, uh, you know, I, I loved Nashville and I loved, you know, I did a lot of early, as soon as I got there, I got a bunch of songs signed by Tammy Wynette company and, and then Tammy Wynette died and so that was kind of wrecked that. But uh, so I, I love that, but I was always uh, the music in well, any entertainment industry, any industry at all, really, but particularly in entertainment, you ha that has to be your, you, you have to need that. You have to like really need. And I was just, I had that kind of energy focused on Meher Baba, never on the music industry. So I, you know, I, I had all kinds of little things where I had lost so many opportunities where I always said, nah, you know, I'd rather do, if I do that, then I have to completely stop doing this other stuff I'm doing. And it just, it wasn't right for me. And then I ended up, you know, with no, you know, I was a high school dropout. I dropped out of high school when I was 15 and, and was traveling with blues bands and stuff. And, uh, thanks to my wife who was very supportive and, uh, issue you'd have to be to put up with me all these years but um i, I ended up getting a you know i got a, 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 a what do they call it, a minority scholarship at tsu and then i got a scholarship at the diff school and went on to the uh, to the uh, graduate school and uh, i would never have dreamed in a million years that's what would happen but uh, but that did i'm glad i you know i from a time i was when I was a kid, I uh, injured my arm very badly, uh, very traumatic. You know, it had serious trauma. But it, more traumatic than that was a three-week hospitalization. And at that time, this, I don't know if you're familiar with John Bowlby, but it was before John Bowlby did his work on attachment and all of that. And uh, he later worked in hospitals. And now I went to the same hospital where I stayed as a kid. And the parents, everybody's in the same room. They did all the stuff. But at that time, Nobody could visit me. I was there for three weeks at four years old, could never see any of my parents. So uh, I say all that just to say that uh, I began playing music um, and got into Jung. Both of the it, it played music to try and exercise my arm to get that back into shape. I'd injured my arm. And, uh, and I got into Jung to try to deal with all the trauma stuff. So all of that kind of snowball, but that it ended up the way the path I took was the right one, uh, even though I would have loved to, you know, as I was saying about people who make a lot of money and then their work goes down, I'm, I'm sure that quickly would have happened to me and I would have fallen into all kinds of bad behaviors. So anyways, that's my, I, I did work a lot in Nashville. Uh, I had a wonderful friend, piano player named Mark Sorrells, who's still out playing around, I think, uh, who he was great. I was always terrible at getting gigs, but he would, we worked, you know, weddings and we worked, uh, restaurants and all this stuff. I just had as a duo, me singing and playing guitar and him, uh, playing piano. And we, so we worked all over town and, and country clubs and all that kind of stuff. I would never have gotten that kind of work. So I, I did, you know, did do a lot of music in Nashville. The blues is 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 an, a profound beginning with all of that. And Karen and 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 Adele will tell us we had a wonderful session on Jung and mm -hmm. and 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 blues. Which yeah, can you, can, Adele, can you tell tell who that was? Our, the, our session. Yeah, we uh, Dr. Mark Winborn. Do you, are you familiar? I mean, he's got a book on blues. Yeah, yeah. He has yeah, a yeah. book called Deep Blues, and yeah. he's in Memphis. 
and he he did a, a section. Is that one of the ones we have recorded on our YouTube channel? I think so. I think so. It is. Yeah. By the way, just putting in a little plug for that. And thank you, James, for letting us record this. But we are now able, since we're doing these on Zoom, to record them. And we have a Nashville Young Circle uh, Zoom channel. I mean, right. to YouTube channel. No, I would like to see that, yeah. I wanted to make one more comment and say I could talk about this subject all day because I'm fascinated by the creative process. But there seems to, I've observed this, and I'm, I'm not any of you are trying to make a living off of art. There's the process versus the product. So people, and it feels like at times, maybe people who are not depending on it for a living are freer to focus just on the process, mm -hmm. going with the process and enjoying the, the process of making art without any product, in product. Right. Did you say yeah, something? well, you always have an end product, but it's not always something that's commodified. They talk about the commodification mm -hmm. of art. And uh, yeah, so when you commodify, when you make it a commodity, then it's 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 mm -hmm. it tends to be top down. You're, you're because you have certain demands that you have to meet by Thursday, and you do it, and then you're on to the next demand. Whereas uh, what you, the process you're talking about is being being able to be more open. Now there's some brilliant people in the uh, in the entertainment world who are able to make those things. Uh, thank goodness, uh, blend very nicely. They're able, clearly they've got a lot of soul and a lot of their being into this, and they're also responding, you know, to uh, a market. They're able to create a commodity that's that's just beautiful. So. I don't know how they do it, but they're, they're people who seem to manage. Um, Alan? Yeah, I just want to make one last comment. Um, I, I tend to trust Jung whenever he discusses creativity, just because his paintings are incredible. Yeah. Uh, and this is a guy who's just trained as a doctor, uh, you know, quite analytical, but in that period that he was uh illustrating what would become the red book i mean those are those are just stellar and he would not allow any of that to be published during his lifetime yeah Matter of fact the family wouldn't allow it for many 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 years until they found sonu shamdasani as being somebody that they could trust to present it respectfully and, and correctly and so i mean he he clearly was not doing it the the audience he was doing it for was his own unconscious and trying to keep that going and he says specifically that that work in the red book everything that came after all his work it, all his development of all that structure that i was talking about all of that came after he did the red book work he said it all flowed directly out of that he said that he was trying to articulate in scientific terms the things that he learned through that process it's amazing, amazing. Yep. yeah thanks well, thank you, James. This was uh, wonderful. There's just a lot. I can feel all the energy. There's a lot of energy with this. So, um, you know, I hope everyone is inspired as I am uh, to get back into what I used to do. Um, so, and, and I want you all to save the date. Um, uh, October 23rd, myself and Alan, uh, you will be co-leading um, uh, uh, Ghosted. Young and the paranormal. So that should be interesting and uh, hopefully fun. And then on November 13th, Tony Caldwell, he's our, uh, he's an analyst here in Nashville, and he's going to be talking on reimagining masculinity. So I hope you all can join us then. And thank you all so much. And hopefully we'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you, Karen and Adele. Right. Thank you, everybody. You guys are a wonderful group. I really appreciate being here with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.